Hello! Welcome to KJB Believers. Today we're going to be starting on a series. Uh, we're going to go through the dispensations from the Old Testament to the very beginning of the New Testament. All right, so for our starting verse that I want to go to that is very important for this teaching is, of course, 2 Timothy 2.15. If you would like to go there in your Bible, and of course, I got my physical Bible here, but I'll start, uh, I'll be using the eSword a lot throughout this whole video. All right, an eSword is a free program. You can get it and, and for free online. Just type in e-sword, and it should pop up on the browser, and you should be able to get it. All right, well, amen. Let me go ahead and find a, let me go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2, chapter 2, verse 15. It reads as so. And if you have your King James Bible with you, I would recommend you follow along with me. And, he, and as long as, um, of course, you have your Bible with you and you follow along through the eSword, it's up to you. I'm going to have the scripture up on the screen regardless, but I would prefer you to follow along with the Bible, right, if you have a physical Bible. All right. So 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, so as you can see, the Bible commands us first of all to study. This is the only translation, right? I don't know if you can see that. The King James Bible, KJV, this is the only translation where you will see the word study there. Every other translation has converted it to do your best diligence or try your best, right? I wonder who doesn't want you to study. Could be the devil, right? So the King James Bible tells you to study a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Approved, first of all, approved unto God. Show yourself approved unto God. Okay, now there's many different reasons why we would want to study the Bible, maybe to impress some people or friends. But in reality, the main reason why we should study the Bible is, as the verse says, to show ourselves approved unto God. Not the preacher, not the pastor or the priest or your friend. No. Unto God. That's what the Bible says. A workman I need not to be ashamed. And there's nothing to be ashamed about studying the Bible. Right? And even if you do go ahead and mention you do study the Bible, you might face some ridicule. But you should never be ashamed of it. Never. Because the Bible says uh, that the gospel, right, is the power of God unto salvation to the uh, Jew first and also to the Greek. And the Bible says in Romans, or I think it's 1 Corinthians or Romans, faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God, okay? So the only way faith can happen in a believer is by hearing the word of God or reading it, but mainly hearing it and putting their faith in the gospel, right? So that's what the Bible says, to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? Now that's taken away in most versions also, They'll want to take away, cut straight, you know, whatever. No, it means rightly dividing. That's what the Bible says. There are divisions in your King James Bible. And we're going to talk about that in this uh, first video. Uh, we're going to go through the overviews of dispensationalism. But in this same video, we're going to start on the first dispensation, which is innocence. Okay. Now, I'm going to go over here. If you have this book, uh, I have the uh, digital copy. But you can also get the physical copy, Dispensational Truth by Clarence Larkin. Amazing stuff. If you want a deeper study on this, you can order it online. Now, in this book right here, uh, 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 Dr. Larkin, he goes through the dispensations of the Bible, as you can clearly see. We have uh, the three stages of the earth, well, different earths. The original earth, the earth that then was being overflowed with water perished, 2 Peter 3. And then now we got the restored earth, which is our present earth today. Now, as you can see, right after we got the Edenic dispensation, in other words, innocence. That's what we're going to be talking about later on in this video. But as you can see, there's other dispensations as well. We got conscience right here, also known as the antediluvial dispensation, fancy world, uh, fancy word. After conscience, we got the post-Diluvian uh, dispensation, which is human government, and it ends at the Tower of Babel. And that's where it precisely ends, when God confounded the languages. 
After that, we got dispensation of the promise or patriarchal or family. Now, in this dispensation, God calls out Abraham and gives him a couple of promises. We'll go through that in this, in this series. After promise, we got the legal dispensation. When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and also the 613 laws as well, the Levitical laws and etc., and you'll notice at the very end of this dispensation comes the cross, the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he went ahead and nailed those ordinances to his cross, according to Colossians. And after that, we have the church age, uh, the or the age of grace, as he calls it here, the age of grace. Now, later on, the rapture will happen at the church. When the church is taken out, and and of course most most uh, scholars don't recognize the tribulation or the Daniel seventieth week as a as a dispensation. Some do and some don't. That's okay either or. It doesn't bother me. But for this for for this series of videos, I I, I guess I'll recognize it because it is its own its own separate time period. The tribulation time period is very unique from the from the original law of the Old Testament, and it's very unique from the church age. So after the tribulation, the Lord will come down, and after he comes down, he'll do the judgment of nations, which is found, I think, in Matthew 24, 25. And then from then on, he'll establish his reign in the millennial reign. All right, so in total, we got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven dispensations, if you're not counting tribulation. Tribulation makes it eight. So yeah, we, we got seven or eight dispensations here. So the first dispensation we're going to be looking at on is uh, the Edenic dispensation. All right. So starting off here, I would like to go to Genesis. Or actually, before I go to Genesis, before I go to Genesis, I would like to point out that, as I mentioned in my last video... Uh, maybe uh, the audio was a little garbage. I noticed the audio was bad, and I and I apologize for that. Uh, it was the headset that I was using. It was interfering with the audio. But as I mentioned in my previous video, uh, dispensationalism does exist in the Bible. Paul mentions it like four times. All right? So it is something that does exist. Some people try to say it doesn't exist. I, I don't know how you can see or do that. Well, either way, we'll be starting off in Genesis Chapter 2, verse 8. Let me get there real quick. So, notice what the Bible says. Let me see here in my notes. All right. The Bible says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? And if we skip down here to verse 15, uh, the, these previous verses talk about the rivers, the certain rivers. I don't, I'm not going to be getting into that in this video. We're just going to touch on the highlights of the dispensation of innocence. So if you notice in 2.15, the Bible says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. So as you notice, this is the set of rules during the dispensation of innocence. God is telling Adam to dress the garden and keep it. Now, as we can see, God told Adam a certain rule. Dress the garden and keep it, as the Bible says. Now, notice how that is different from all the other times in the Bible when God deals with man. Noah, for example, he told Noah, build an ark. For us today in the church age, we are told to put our faith and trust on the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. Okay? Two com completely different things. Things that are different are not the same. Amen? It's just plain common sense. Okay? And I want to show that in here through the scriptures with you. So let me see here. Uh, let's go to Genesis 2, 16. Genesis 2, 16. All right. 
Look, look what God said here. Look what God said. And the Lord God commended the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Hmm. Look at that. So so notice what, what God is telling him here. And, and of course, uh, I guess... Uh, a new a new translation. Well, I'm just kidding when I say this. I don't believe in new translations, but a certain new translation could say it like this: Get your cotton picking mouth off of that cotton picking tree. All right, that's the new favorable translation right there. <laughs> right. So basically, in other words, don't eat the tree. Don't eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, you're gonna die. All right, you are gonna die. And and you know what? We we already know how this ends. Okay, but. But let me, let me keep going through here. Notice what, what God is telling him. This is pure salvation by works, okay? This is pure salvation by works. And what I mean by salvation is their righteousness. Their righteousness is kept by their works, okay? That's what, you, that's what you need to understand. And they fail. If they fail in this ordinance, the Bible says, shall surely die, okay? Now, of course, we can see that parallel right there. Our righteousness is kept was given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ when he imputes his righteousness to us. All right. It, we, uh, God has not given us a situation where if we do something, we will have spiritual death. Or, or I mean, of course, we're going to have physical death unless the rapture comes, praise the Lord. But, but we're not going to have spiritual death if we, it doesn't matter what we do. We're never going to encounter spiritual death. Uh, I think it's uh, the Bible says, uh, he that sh believeth on me shall never die. That's what Jesus said. Never die. Never means never. So notice the distinction right there. It's just pure works that God is telling Adam. Don't eat of the tree. Now you might say, well, well, I'm sure Adam had some faith, right? Did, did he, Adam have some faith in God? Not necessarily. And I'm going to get to that in a bit. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 notice what the bible says okay notice what the bible says now faith all right faith now is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen so notice that so so when we have faith in something we're putting our faith in something that we can't see right we put our faith and trust on jesus right but we can't see him if we could see him and if we could see all the operations, that all the different ways that he's working on the world, if we can see the entirety of God, we will need to have faith. We will be living by sight, right? Now, the reason why we have faith is because it's the evidence of things not seen, as the Bible says. And another verse of scripture that uh, talks about this is in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Let me get there real quick. Uh, the, uh, the Apostle Paul making this statement here in 2 Corinthians, he makes a statement for we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay, so when we are living our daily walk as a Christian, we do not see the Lord. We do not see the angels. We are trusting in this by simple faith. Okay, simple faith, not sight. So if there's sight, there's going to be no faith. If there's no sight, there's going to, there's going to be uh, faith. That is why in the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you read in Revelation, I'm not going to talk in that now. In Revelation, it says um, when it talks about the nations getting to eat of the tree of life, right? It says, blessed are they that keep his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life. That's what the Bible says in Revelation. Keep his commandments. That's works. Now, in the context there, that's to the nations that are there, not to us. We're the church. We're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Right? So we are saved by faith and kept by the grace of God. But in the millennial reign, they will not need faith because they'll see God. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, sitting upon the throne of David. Amen. Like it says in Isaiah chapter 9. They will see him. They will, uh, Jesus Christ will literally teach them. They will require no faith. All they'll, they'll require to do is keep the commandments. Now, 
some people say, well, do they have to keep doing it like perpetually? And then after a certain amount of time, then they get the tree of life. I don't know. Maybe it's just a one time thing. Oh, I kept this and maybe and then I get the tree of life. We don't know. The Bible doesn't go into specifics there, but it does say if you keep the commandments, you will have the, uh, the right to the tree of life. OK, now that is very different from a Christian today. Jesus said, uh, let me find it real quick right here. Uh, and I fixed the audio, so it shouldn't it shouldn't be. He, uh, son. Let me find it. Real quick. Oh, it made that. Uh, oh well, I, I think you won't be able to hear it. Uh, let me see. Half life. Okay, so notice what the Bible says in John three thirty six. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's present tense. Hath everlasting life. Okay, so I already have everlasting life. I don't need to get it from a tree like the nations will. You know, so as you can see, things that are different are not the same already. It's just plain common sense. And if someone can't understand that, I, I don't know what to tell you. That's what the Bible says. I try to be kind with you. If you disagree, well, it's okay. I still love you. You don't have to agree with everything that I say. As long as the Bible says it, then it's a fact. If the Bible says it, it's true whether I believe it in or not. There's a, there was a bumper sticker. I remember one time I saw a bumper sticker when I was driving. And, of course, I, my friends mentioned a bumper sticker upon cars. It said this. The Bible says it. I believe it. And that settles it. And it's pretty funny, you know. And, and of course, it's true. But... But in reality, it, it should be changed. It should say this. The Bible says it, whether I believe it or not, <laughs> that settles it. Amen. You know, so so if the Bible says it, it doesn't matter if I believe it or not. That settles it. All right. That settles it. The Bible's uh, the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. That settles it. Amen. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that for sure. So as you saw in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Uh, we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay, so so compare that to Adam. If he eats the fruit, he doesn't have salvation. He's going to die spiritually and physically. Well, he dies spiritually regardless. But thank God, through the grace of God, something happens after that. And I'll get to that in a bit. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Now notice this. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God hath ma had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of, of the garden? Now, I want to stop right there. Okay, now this is not part of my lesson plan, but I just want to mention something real quick. Notice what the, the devil said. Yea, hath God said. As you notice, the very first word that the devil mentions is to cause doubt on the word of God. This to cause doubt. Yea, hath God said. Did God really say that? Did he really mean that? No, that's not what it means. You know. So, you see, when, when you encounter other people, or when I've encountered other people, I've encountered people who say, well... That's not what God really meant, right? No. God meant what he said, and he said what he meant. Amen? Yea, hath God said? Yeah, God said it. And that sells the fact. Amen? You know, so as you notice, when when my viewers, if you're watching me, uh, whenever someone questions the word of God, right? Is this true? Is this not true? Oh, you know, and maybe they'll look at the King James Bible and say, well, this has an error right here. The original Greek says, no correct it. Or, or, well, you see, in this Greek, in this Greek Testament, the original Greek says this over here, the King James Bible is wrong, right? That's doubt. That's causing doubt on the word of God. The Bible says, yea, has God said, those were the devil's first words. Remember that. Whenever a believer gets saved or someone gets saved, the first thing, usually the first thing that happens is that God causes the believer to doubt on the word of God. Maybe from some of the scholars or guess what? 
God, I mean, uh, the devil has been known to even use Christians in his work as well, causing doubt in the word of God. And it's really sad. It's really, really sad. But either way, let's keep going here. Genesis uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees uh, of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. You see, the serpent is already lying already. As liar, uh, as Jesus said yeah, to the Pharisees, you're liars like your father, right? Murder him because whenever the devil speaks, he, sp when he lies, he speaks in his native tongue, right? He's a liar. Verse 5, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. Well, look at that. Knowing good and evil, you shall be as gods. Now, I'm going to enter a really controversial issue here, but I, I, I don't. It doesn't. I don't. I don't care either way because it's the word of God. Amen. I find joy in the word of God. Notice how Eve did not even question. What? What do you mean, gods? What are you talking about? She didn't say that. She knew clearly what he he was talking about. Of course, in those days, he had the sons of God, or sometimes known known as little g gods, in in the Book of Psalms. Which are, of course, the the angels of Satan, and also, of course, the sons of God. Also, refer to the angels of God as well, depending on the context. So, notice that she already knew that there were these beings out there, and it, and it tempted her, as you as you see in, in verse six. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now notice what verse 6 says. She saw that the tree was good for food. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me let me uh, put this up here. Sorry. Sorry if I, if I was blocking it. But she saw that the tree was good for food. All right. Now notice, sin always begin with, begins with the eyes. If you remember what Jesus said, uh, the the eyes are, are the windows to the soul. I think it was, or if if you have a, a dark eye, if you if you watch a lot of bad stuff, you're going to be filled with that, right? So sin always begins with the eyes, as you can see. That's uh, that's your flesh gate. Your flesh has five senses, as you know. The eyes is one of them. That's how the devil uses to, uh, that's what the devil uses to attract sin to your life, the eyes. That's why you got to be careful of what you're watching. You know, are you, are you looking on God's holy word? I'm like, oh, you know, you know, growing in the grace of God, right? Or are you watching garbage programs, you know, uh, or Disney plus that's a bunch of garbage. I had to get rid of that one. They started showing some LGBTQRS garbage out there, you know? <laughs> so I just wanted to get rid of that. Amen. So, so. It matters what you look at. It really does matter what, what you see with your eyes. So I just want to make this comment right here. Uh, as you see in verse as verse 6, they did eat. Now we see that they both disobeyed God and obeyed Satan and therefore sinned against God and ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right? So they ate of the fruit. Now... Their eyes are opened. If we go here um, to Genesis chapter uh, chapter 3, verse 14, God is pronouncing his judgment upon the devil because of this, because he, he, he helped deceive Adam and Eve. But the main one who was at fault is, of course, Adam. The Bible says in Romans, let me get there real quick. Uh, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Notice what the Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin into, entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, right? So God blames Adam for the transgression, the transgression of the man. Why? Because he is the head of the house, right? So if you're married, the head of the house is the man, not the woman, despite of all, what all the, the sissies say in California. 
Oh, by the way, no offense if you live in California. Amen. Amen. But I'm just making a general statement here. By one man sent into the into, entered into the world. Even though it was uh, it was Eve who first ate of the fruit, the 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 charge was counted to Adam, because first of all, he's the he's he's the head of the household, so he's responsible for that. All right, so let me go back here to to number six. I'm sorry, not number six. That's that's in my waypoint, but Genesis three fourteen. Notice what God uh, what the Lord God pronounces on the serpent. And the Lord God said unto the servant, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So I just want to point out here that now this is also a deep study if you want to go into it. And, and I might go into it in the future. I don't really don't have time now. But but basically, uh, the devil's depicted as a serpent, he, and he is a serpent. He is a cherubim. If you do, if you read the major prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, etc., he is a cherubim, and as you know, cherubims they have four faces, right? Now, of course, normal cherubims have four faces: that of a man, lion, ox, man, lion, ox, and eagle. Okay, so th those are the main four fa uh, four faces, and in the Book of Revelation, you notice the beasts are all gathered together. And of course, what, and in that account, each one has its own distinct face, representing the different parts of creation. If you notice, one beast is missing, and that's the one that represents the, the amphibian creature, the reptilian, if you will, the reptilian. You don't see that represented by the cherubim. So of course, it is uh, suggested that the, that the devil was that cherubim that represented the amphibian and, and reptilian. He's also described as Leviathan. And Job 41, where he's in the sea of, and, and he's also dwells in the sea uh, above the above the second heaven, which is a deep study. I don't know why I'm mentioning it to you, but either way, uh, it's just my own rant, <laughs> you know. So either way, as as you can see, he's uh, the devil is cursed above all cattle, and of course, some people say that maybe the serpent had arms and legs, and it could very well be. Uh, I don't know. It could very well be. Now, of course, let's look at the iconic verse right here for all scholars right here. The iconic verse, 315, the prophecy of the gospel. Now, many scholars say, oh, that's the gospel. No, that's not the gospel. That's the prophecy of the gospel. And I'll get into why I say that in a bit. Notice what, notice what God is telling Satan. Now, notice that this is all directed to Satan. He's not talking to the woman here. If you look at the context, everything that God is saying is to Satan. Notice what he says. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Right? So he's looking at Satan. Talk to him. Thee and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. Now as you can see. Uh, of course, that, that is the, the prophecy of the gospel. Now, you might say, well, why do I say the prophecy of the gospel? Well, it's very simple. This can't be the gospel or something that they fully understood about Jesus Christ. If you've researched the scripture, many people say, oh, you see, Jesus Christ is mentioned here. No, I don't see Jesus Christ here. All she knew was that there's going to be enmity between her seed and the devil's seed. Between her and the devil. She didn't know what that meant, but... But she, she knew that was going to happen. And the promise was directed to the devil. As you can see here, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Verse 16. Uh, wait. Let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 15. Notice what it says here. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The bruising here is, is a fatal wound. It's a fatal wound that happens. Now, of course, a, a bruising here in the heel as well. A bruising on the head and a bruising in, in, uh, on the heel. So we already know that when Jesus Christ died, he was that seed of the woman, right? He was the seed of the woman. And his heel was bruised. But he, now this is when it comes to prophecy. Now, if you notice, these, uh, this event is in reverse. And you'll notice this a lot when you're reading. Sometimes the events will be in reverse, uh, it shall bruise thy head. The bruising of the head does not officially happen until until Jesus Christ comes back on the second advent. So if you were to read it in context with the 
the rest of the scope of the Bible. Uh, the second advent is right here, and the first advent is right here. It's crazy how it's ordered like that. You know, you might say, oh, do you have some scripture for that? Yeah, I got some scripture for that. In Romans chapter 16, I think it is. Or actually, let me find my cross references real quick. Because I have some notes on this as well. And this is very interesting. Very interesting. Let me get there real quick. It's really cool. All right. So it shall bruise thy head. Okay, so I want you to go ahead because I don't have the time right now. I'm wasting enough time. Well, not wasting, but I'm spending enough time talking about this right now. So I'm going to list the references here right now for you, viewer, to check out. Because, of course, I don't want to feed you everything. Okay. So it shall bruise thy head. The bruising of, of the head happens exactly in, of course, the second advent. And my scripture verses for that is Psalm 68, verse 21. Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 13. Psalm 110, verse 6. And Romans, chapter 16, verse 20. All right. So I want you to check that, check that out if you can. All right. It's, it's a really cool study to look into. And of course, we know that the bruising of the heel was, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. But he rose from the dead, so that's why it's the heel. Well, either way, I'll, I'll have to keep going here. I don't, I don't want to spend any more time on this. <laughs> uh, it's really fun, though. This is my first time, so please bear with me. All right. So notice what the Bible says. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception... In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay, so she, sh so notice what the Bible says here. She'll have, in sorrow she'll bear forth children. We see that today. And her desire shall be to her husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay, now I'm not a sexist, sexist by any means, but this is part of the curse. OK, part of the curse is that she will be in submission to her husband and he will rule over her. OK, now, of course, and now some people take uh, take this too far. And, and I understand some people do take it too far. That's why Paul says that the husband should be submitted to Christ and the woman should be submitted to, to the husband. Right. So it's an equal submission. The husband submitted to Christ and the woman submitted to him. OK. Now, I'm, oh, that's sexist. No, that's uh, not sexist by any means. That's just the way how God made it. Because as the Apostle Paul said, um, Eve was in the transgression first and then came Adam. Okay, so Eve transgressed first and then came Adam. Of course, the whole charge of penalty was to Adam. He's the one responsible. But technically, the one who took the bite first was technically Eve. So that's why we see this curse here. Okay. So, as we can see here, uh, we see God passing judgment. We see God passing judgment upon Adam, even Satan, and also in the rest of the verses, all the way to verse 21. I think it is. Let me, let me see. Uh, let me go to verse 21. Oh, well, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm already skipping through. Well, either way, we see God passing judgment upon Adam, even Satan. And Genesis 3.15, we already read, we see God talking about the seed of the woman, bruising the head of the serpent. This is referring to Jesus Christ. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ, which neither Adam nor, ne nor Eve knew about. Okay, so that's something you need to understand, too. Eve did not understand that this was going to be Jesus Christ, right? A Messiah. Well, I mean, later on, the prophets realized it was going to be a Messiah. But, but my point is that Eve nor Adam understood that this was going to be Jesus Christ dying for our sins on the cross of Calvary. They didn't understand that. That was a mystery. And the Bible clearly says that in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 10. I want to get there real quick. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, of which salvation, of course, the context being our salvation, the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls by trusting in Christ. Notice what verse 10 says. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Right? Now, this is talking to the church now, us. Notice verse 11. 
searching what or what matter of manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So you'll notice in the scriptures, and not just here in Genesis 3.15, but you'll also notice in Isaiah 53, right? You'll notice in all these other passages, uh, Psalm 22, David describing, they pierced my hands and my feet, they cast lots be before my garment, you know, describing in detail the sufferings of Christ, right? Uh, that is not being denied here. That's a fact. Uh, Peter talks about that. But, but here's what many, what many people get messed up in. Many people think that people were looking forward to the cross, looking forward to the resurrection. Or I mean, I'm sorry, looking forward to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, right? But notice what the next verse says. Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you, by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So notice what the Bible says. These, even these Old Testament prophets, they technically preach the gospel. They preach the death, burial, and resurrection. Right? Of course, they didn't understand a single word they were saying. Right? Because even if you read through Psalm 22, all... all David is thinking about is how he's feeling when how he's feeling when the end when his enemies are persecuting him. And the reason why I say that is because he mentions they pierced my hands and my feet. Was David's hands, physical hands and physical feet pierced? No. No. He's just describing how he felt in that in that passage of scripture, not knowing that he was prophesying, not knowing that he was prophesying of the sufferings of Christ, which of course now. It is revealed by the Holy Ghost. Wow, he's talking about Jesus Christ, and he didn't even know about it, right? So you see that a lot throughout the whole scriptures. And I just want to point that out there and make that known because so many people get confused on this topic right here. And of course, with this same confusion, it can lead into error if you're not careful. All right, so this is amazing right here. Now let's go back here to, uh, I already went to First Peter. Uh, Let's, let's go back here to uh, Genesis 3.21. Genesis 3.21 right here. And now notice, now notice, of course, um, now this is this is grace right here. Genesis 3.21. And then to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skins and clothe them. All right. So... As you remember previously in Genesis, and we skipped a couple of it, they try to cover themselves up with leaves and with leaves and, and of course figs and etc. They try to call, cover themselves up with their own works. But God was going to have that. He, God did the work here. He covered them with the coats of skins. He shed the blood of the animal to cover them up. All right, now this is a beautiful type of a typology, a spiritual application here for us Christians today. Because, uh, as you can see, they tried with their own works, they tried to cover up their own nakedness. But the Lord said, no, I have to do it. Now, of course, that's a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. We can't, if we try to work our way to heaven, if we try to work our way to heaven, that's not going to work out too well. You have to let the Lord Jesus do it. All right, and all you have to do is put your faith and trust in him. Amen. Now, that's a beautiful type. Now, if you notice, he, uh, God made coats of skins and clothed them. He shed the blood of the animal. And as you can clearly see in Hebrews 9.22, let me go there real quick. Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Okay? There is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. So that's what you need to understand. If God is going to forgive something, it has to be through the shedding of blood. And that's throughout all dispensations. That's just a fact that it's throughout all dispensations. In fact, you see that very prevalent in, in Cain and Abel. Abel offers up a blood sacrifice. Cain offers up the fruit of the ground, which if you remember, it was cursed. The ground was cursed. A, um, Cain was bringing up something that was cursed to offer to God. Right, that's not going to work out well. And not only that, but it it's supposed it's implied that the parents 
of Adam and Eve pass down what they learned from God, their experience and how they try to cover themselves up with, with the ground, with the, with the fruit of the ground, leaves, etc. That didn't work out too well. And if you realize Abel's sacrifice was accepted because he offered it by faith, right? Now, of course, keep in mind, this is after they were cast out. So they didn't see God face to face how Adam and Eve saw them. But as the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God, right? So Abel had to offer it up by faith and works, okay? The shed blood of the animal. And I want to make the statement right here. And it's sort of self-contradictory of what I just said, but um, uh, on on how we're saved today by faith alone. But I'm going to make the statement right here. It's always been throughout the whole Bible. It's always been by faith and works. Amen. Now you might say, whoa, whoa, that's heresy. And, and wait a second now. Let me explain myself now. It's always been by faith and works. The difference in this dispensation, the church age, is that God did the works. As you remember, Jesus said in the book of John, I must work the works of him that sent me, as Jesus said. God did the works. He shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, so I didn't. All I have to do is put my faith and trust in what he did for me at the cross of Calvary. Amen. So technically, my salvation involves faith and works. His work on the cross and my faith on what he did on the cross of Calvary. Amen. So, yeah, that's just another way to look at it. Amen. That, and, you know, of course, my pastor mentioned that to me, you know, and then that's a good, a really good analogy. Amen. So as, as we can see here, uh, he gave them coats of skins. And, and as you can see, uh, this dispensation ends up ending in complete, complete uh, destruction. Well, I guess you would say, because not only did they fall into sin, but they also get kicked out of the garden. And this sort of has to do with grace also. This is also graceful because notice what God did here. No, notice verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken so he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. I just mentioned that last time. The devil was a cherubim. And a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So, of course, you know, they get kicked out of the garden, and that might be upsetting. But in reality, this is sort of God's grace here. And God has always shown grace throughout the whole Bible. Amen. He has always shown grace. He kicked them out of the garden because... If they eat of the tree of life, they would always live forever in that sinful condition that they were in, in the state of conscience. So out of his own grace, he kicked them out and protected the, the way of the tree of life with cherubims. Amen. So as you can see, God has always shown grace and he's always shown um, favor and and he's always shown that in order for their for for sin to be forgiven there has to be a shedding of blood if you will so basically in summary the main difference between innocence and after innocence is in innocence all they needed to do was works as soon as they bit the tree and God kicked them out conscience knowledge of good and evil amen knowledge of good and evil they didn't see god face to face so they needed to have faith so after that was faith and works now this is the only dispensation the church age where it's faith alone as paul clearly says in his pauline epistles and i i will later on uh, later on in the year i will do a study on that i got so many plans for this channel amen but I just want to start it off here on, on innocence. Well, no, you know, might as well start it off on the very first dispensation. Amen. So, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this study that we have done so far. I hope you check through the references that I gave you. Because, again, it doesn't matter what I say. It matters what the Bible says. Amen. Because I, I can go ahead and, and pull stuff out of context if I want. And you won't know any better. So I want you to go ahead and study and look for yourself. I don't want you to go ahead and just believe everything I say. Just look for yourself and look to the scripture references I gave you. Amen.
you know, as the Bible says, iron, iron sharpeneth iron. Amen. I, I would like to hear from you in the comment section if you have any questions. I will go ahead and, and post my email there. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and email me. Okay. Or either way, till the next time. God bless you.